Welcome to the Pure Prison Podcast, a Society First production. My name is Shai Hillman. Before we begin, we want to give an introduction of our goals, and that is to provide a platform that identifies both the problem and the solutions to the criminal justice system. The purpose behind Pure Prison Podcast is to give a voice not only to those who have been impacted by the system, but also to those who are positively impacting the system. Society First wants to ensure that all guests feel free to express their thoughts and beliefs. With that being said, not all views and beliefs of those interviewed are necessarily the views of Society First. With that, we hope that we will inspire you to get involved, for it's only together that we will make a difference. Well, welcome back to Pure Prison, everybody. We are so happy to have you today. And we have Allison Miller in with us today. Now, she is a public defender, and um, she's going to be running for state attorney. Um, I'm going to bring her in, let her introduce herself, and then we actually have some questions for her today. Um, I think that you would like to know as the public, and she's going to be able to answer them. So here we go. Hi, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. We are so, so happy to be on this journey with you. Um, it's so exciting for us. Um, and I know it's, it's exciting for you too. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, um, and what you're about to do. Sure. So my name is Allison Miller. I have lived all over. I was born in Texas, moved to North Carolina, really grew up in Orlando. I'm a Floridian at heart. I went to college at the University of Notre Dame and came back to Florida for law school at Florida State Law School. And then I ended up starting working as a public defender in Tallahassee, and that's the second judicial circuit. So Florida is made up of 20 different judicial circuits. It's roughly about the same population size. And so some of those circuits have a lot more counties than other circuits because we try to keep it as close to equitable or equitably represented um, in population size. Miami-Dade is its own circuit in and of itself and it's almost 3 million people, which is a lot larger. So I say we try. So I started as a public defender actually when I was in law school at Florida State in Tallahassee. And I met my husband in law school at Florida State and he is from Sarasota and I am from Orlando, and so we decided to split the difference. And after law school, we moved to the Tampa area where I started working as a public defender in the Sixth Circuit, which is Pinellas and Pasco counties. Um, I've been there ever since. We ended up moving to St. Petersburg uh, shortly thereafter. We were new to the area and didn't really know what our, our vibe was and a fan of Tampa, but just felt like St. Pete was more us. And so I've been at the public defender's office in the Sixth Circuit since 2008, I most recently was supervising both of our offices in Pasco County in, in Dade City and Newport Ritchie. And I handle all of the capital cases, all of the death penalty cases where the state of Florida is seeking the death penalty for both counties. And I've been doing the death penalty work for about a decade. I became the capital case coordinator supervising our office's representation of all uh, first degree murder, second degree murder cases in 20. 20- 17, 2018. And I announced my candidacy for state attorney June 3rd of this year. When I announced my candidacy, I actually resigned from the public defender's office. I didn't want there to be an appearance of a conflict of interest. I am running against the man who is the acting state attorney. He was appointed state attorney by Governor DeSantis after the long-serving state attorney Bernie McCabe unexpectedly passed away January 1st. And so I didn't want to be working at the PD's office running against the man who was prosecuting all of our office's clients. So I'm now in private practice for the first time ever. Um, I work for a law firm called Ripley Wisenhunt, still doing capital defense across the state in the Southeast. And I teach nationally capital jury selection. But so it has been a, a month of change, I would say. I'm running for state attorney. I'm in private practice. It's a whole new world. Wow. Well, you know what? Change is good. Change is good. It's growth. That is just beautiful. So that kind of, now everybody knows a little bit of the background. And we did here at Society First, we were just so excited. Um, and we combined some questions together. And I know that you have some answers and I haven't heard them yet. Um, I have 
read your perspective. Of course, I Googled you. You know, I was trying to <laughs> same, same girl. <laughs> and, you, and you come up on Google really nicely, yeah. way better than me. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we have our story and we're in a very similar space, right? So we have our stories that brought us here, but we ended up kind of in a, a similar space here together today. That is amazing. Thank you. And it's just, it shows your forward thinking and we so much appreciate it. So um, I find it so interesting that you've spent your years, like you said, as a public defender. Okay, so you're 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 giving victims, you know, helping them. Um, you're looking at efficiency, the safety of the legal system, and, and how it works. And now you're running for, for the polar opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the polar opposite, right? And and one of the questions that we had was, how do you not compromise your core belief? You know, that has been at the center of defending the individuals you're now going to be prosecuting. Mm -hmm. how, how and I would disagree. I don't think they're polar opposites. I think that both sides seek justice. And I pride myself on what I have been doing for the last 15 years in the public defender system is seeking justice. It's just who you're advocating on behalf of. And for the system to work effectively, there needs to be advocacy with equal fervor on both sides. Right, you need good prosecutors and you need good defense lawyers. Oh, and no. To be honest, when I went into, when I became a lawyer, when I, I knew I wanted to work in crime, I didn't want to commit crime, but I knew I wanted to be a lawyer in the criminal field. Uh, I interviewed and we knew we, and my husband and I knew we were going to end up relocating to the Tampa Bay area. I interviewed with both Bernie McCabe state attorney's office and Bob Dillinger's public defender office, public defender's oh. office. And I genuinely felt like I could have done, I could have worked at either place because I want to fundamentally as a person help people. And as a prosecutor, you have a much larger vehicle. You have a much greater space to help people. Um, okay. I have a job offer from Bob Dillinger First, the day I passed the bar, Mr. Dillinger called me the next day and offered me the job. And I think I started the following Monday at the PD's office and the rest is history. And I'm so grateful for the experience. It is who I am. I identify very much as a public defender. And so I don't want to suggest that I think it's going to be easy to all of a sudden switch. Um, and, you know, I knew very little about the Sixth Circuit and how the public defender's office and the state attorney's office worked prior to relocating here. And so I still believe very strongly that the prosecutors and the prosecutor's office has a much greater space to help people okay. um, as a whole. I think there are a lot of people at the state attorney's office in the Sixth Circuit who are there because they want to help people. I just don't think that office, the way it works now, gives any of their attorneys the discretion to do so. Understood. And one of the huge fundamental problems I have with the office, and I think that it would have clashed with my personality working there and not being given discretion to handle the cases I was prosecuting as I saw appropriate. And so I'm not looking to become a prosecutor at the office. I'm looking to become the prosecutor at the office because I think there needs to be a fundamental change and shift in the philosophy of how the office prosecutes. Absolutely. And I think that you hit on a couple of the questions. The second one was, as a new state attorney, what will be your main focal point um, to better the system that stay true to bringing justice, as you just spoke of, like the efficiency, the safety, the legal? I mean, that's a, that, like you said, that is a broad spectrum. Right. And, right. And it's a mighty task. And so public safety has to be the first priority. Um, and I think that we as people, or at least I hope we as people all fundamentally want the same things. We want to be safe in our homes. We want to know when we go to sleep at night that, that we and our families are safe. And beyond that, we want to know that the criminal justice system treats everybody equitably. If you got in trouble, you would want to be treated fairly. And that's where I think right now we have a major shortcoming. And so the Sixth Circuit, I am a big fan of data and number and numbers and statistics, um, you know, because I think there's going to be an insinuation that I come from a certain bias and that's fair. And so I rely on numbers and data to support my positions. The Sixth Circuit, Pinellas and Pasco, sends more people to prison, according to the Florida Department of Corrections, than any other circuit in Florida. And so that includes Miami-Dade, which so... Pinellas is about a million people. Pasco's just shy of 600,000. So we're at 1.6 million. 
as a circuit and Miami-Dade's almost 3 million and it's Miami. Um, but so the Sixth Circuit is sending more people to prison than any other circuit. Orange Osceola, Duval, Miami. And, and, I, and what we've seen over time is this mentality of lock everybody up and throw away the key doesn't actually make anybody safer. It does greater harm to the community as a whole long term. And we have to start somewhere in correcting that. And that's what I want to do. I'm so happy. This this, <laughs> this this excites me. I mean, and and because of my background, um, you know, I was in the corporate world for many years. I'm a mother. Um, I've done a lot of things, and as a former incarcerated person, and seeing some of the unfairness in the sentencing and and from different counties because people come in all the time from different counties, and I saw it from that side, and to see someone on your side that is now on our side, <laughs> it's so beautiful and, and it's time, it's so time. All right, so we understand that this next question, this one might not bode so great uh, for a no, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. Okay, all right. Um, can you explain what is broken and what is lacking in the present state attorney's office and, and its approach in best serving the communities that it represents. And so I touched on this a little bit before, there's yes. no forward thinking. It's been our how we've prosecuted crime in the Sixth Circuit for the last 40, 50 years has been, there's been a crime, now there must be punishment without any forward thinking. How does that punishment, how does what we're doing to the offender punish the offender long-term, but how does it also punish the community long-term? And so we need to have a greater focus on correcting the harm, whether it be poverty, substance abuse, drug dependency, mental health issues, and treat the offender as well as punish the crime so we're not doing more long-term damage to the community. And that, that goes hand in hand with the racial inequity in how we prosecute. And so a lot of the platforms that I have will are, are designed to correct racial inequity. And so I'm, for instance, I'm not going to prosecute simple possession of marijuana. I don't think law enforcement wants to spend their time arresting people for possession of joints. It's not a good use for man hours as well as taxpayers' dollars. And beyond that, the criminalization of marijuana, I think we all know, has disproportionately victimized entire communities of black and brown people. And mm. so if we're going to fix that and we're going to start working towards a more equitable system, we have to have policies that reflect where we want to go. Similarly, I'm not going to charge children as adults, except in rare circumstances where it's legally required. And I will assess each case on a case-by-case -case basis, but the law allows prosecutors broad discretion for this reason. And so Pinellas County, for instance, is 18% Black. The community is 18% Black. Yet last year, the state attorney's office direct filed or charged children as adults, direct filed 74% of, excuse me, let me try that again, 74% of children who were direct filed was Black were black, excuse me. So if you are two to three times more likely to be charged as an adult, if you are a black or brown child, there's a problem. And so where the state attorney's office has failed is their trope seems to be, I don't know the race of the defendant I charge. I don't know the race of the defendant whose sentence I recommend. I don't know the race of the, the child who I direct filed. I don't know the race of the defendant who I seek the death penalty for. And one, I think that's nonsense. I think contextually, we always know the race, right? Um, did the crime happen in, if you're in Pinellas County, did it happen in Seminole? Did it happen in Baskins? Did it happen in Jordan Park? Did it happen in Old Northeast? I mean, there are, you know, we remain a fairly segregated community in the community. And so there are always contextually clues about the race of the person that whatever discretion is being exercised against. But beyond that, if you really don't know the race, but the disparity is as great as it is, if the county is 18% black, yet 74% of children who are being direct filed are black, and you really don't know the race of the kids you're direct filing, then you should. So yes. shame on you for not. And so mm -hmm. I, I would like to have the punishment fit the crime, but also have some forward thinking in there about what is the harm that we are doing to the community by removing this person putting them in the Department of Corrections, 
with no education, no job prospects, no ability to live in federally subsidized housing, and where do we go from there? And and let me just say very quickly for, for our audience, if you do not know what a direct file means, that means this juvenile was charged as an adult. He will not go to a juvenile detention center or any such thing. He will go directly to big boy prison. He goes to so the direct file, you're correct, is yes. when, and so the prosecutor has given the discretion in most circumstances to charge children as adults. We call it direct filing into the adult system. Because a child is charged as an adult doesn't necessarily mean there's adult sanctions. The child can still be sentenced back as a juvenile. And a lot of it has to do with the way that the process works now is the state attorney's office wants to have control. They want to have control over the outcome of the cases. And so there is no, like the judges don't have any discretion to put the case back in juvenile court, even if the judge thinks that's appropriate. Only the state attorney, you know, in return for some sort of negotiated plea or negotiated disposition could put the case, put the child back in juvenile court. And so a lot of these mechanisms take the control away from the judiciary and give it exclusively to the state attorney, which is the same as the district attorney. I think a lot of people in other states are used to hearing district attorney right. and prosecutor. Right. And that's what I would be used to. And I was really unaware of that, that glitch there. Um, right. So like South Carolina has, for instance, like a reverse waiver. So children can end up charged as adults. And then the defense lawyer could put on a presentation and the judge could say, you know, hearing this and hearing from the state attorney's office, I think it most appropriate for the child to be in the ju in the juvenile system. And the, what people need to know is the biggest fundamental difference is, is the juvenile justice system is intended. The legal purpose is to rehabilitate the child, rehabilitate the offender. Our legislature took for the adult system took out rehabilitation as the purpose. So the only purpose of the adult system is punitive. And so the purpose of juvenile is rehabilitation, purpose of adult is punitive. And so in my my philosophy is as long as the child is a child, and I think 18 is kind of an arbitrary line in the sand that we've drawn, but it is the line that we've drawn. But as long as the child is a child, I'm gonna do everything in my power to rehabilitate that child. Because it doesn't serve the child or the community well to put the child in prison. This is going to be one of those statistics that you're like, no, that's really obvious. If you put a kid in prison as a child, the child is more likely to reoffend when he or she gets out and commit a violent crime than if you had not put the child in prison. That's right? True. That seems really obvious. And yeah. so, and I think another common misconception is that children or even adults only go to prison for violent crime and shy you know that couldn't be further from the truth and it so is I, so scary right and so i represent i represent a young man right now um who was sent to prison at the age of 16 for two counts of possession of cocaine possession of a small amount of cocaine and he went to prison for 28 months and then he's now charged with shooting six people killing four and the state is seeking the death penalty and the line between him going to prison and when we're, where we are right now is an almost direct linear correlation. Okay. Now, our fourth question for you, and you kind of touched on this, um, was how would you correct the shortcomings and how do you plan on implementing the changes um, to a long-standing culture with the state's attorney's office? Right. Well, and that's where, like, philosophically, there has to be a change. Right. And, and philosophically, we have to move away from a carceral or an incarcerative system. So, I mean, this the idea that we can put people in prison for as long as possible and that's somehow going to make us all safer is wrong. Right. We've done that. We've done that forever in the Sixth Circuit. And it doesn't actually make people safer. And it victimizes just entire communities of people. And so. I'm not suggesting that this is an overnight fix. And I think we've seen some progressive prosecutors trying different things out in other jurisdictions in Florida. I have a case in Louisiana. And so I have followed Jason Williams, the DA in Orleans Parish very closely. I'm a huge fan of his. And so, you know, there's going to be good and bad. There's going to be things that work and there's going to be things that we decide we could do better. But we have to start somewhere or we'll like 
he, if we continue to do it as we are and expect things to end up differently, that's literally insanity, right? And so we I was going to say, to let's talk about insanity. Doing right. thing over and expecting it to change. It's not. Right. And so and that's what, like, for me, it's taken my view of this. It has taken generations for us to get here. And so I want to establish confidence in the criminal justice system in Pinellas, Pasco. You know, I use the word restore confidence with a woman who is African-American. And she said, girl, restore is the wrong word. Most folks in our community never had that faith or confidence. And so it starts from the top down. If people have faith in the criminal justice system and they trust in the criminal justice system, that's where we can talk about community policing again. I mean, there is an extent of this that is a partnership. And so if people know that if they end up being prosecuted in the criminal justice system and they're going to be treated with dignity and they're going to be treated fairly, there will be more trust in the system. There will be more cooperation with law enforcement. I think it will actually make law enforcement in the community safer, but it starts with me. It starts at the very top and establishing that confidence, confidence and trust in the, in the criminal justice system has to start today, in my opinion. Absolutely, hands down. And you know the organization that I support, I am a part of, um, Society First. The ripple effect that goes out into our communities when someone is, let's just say, wrongly accused, uh, had a harder sentence than they should have, the sentencing was unfair. I mean, it's the moms, the sons, the daughters, the grandmas, the, the cousins, the, the, the neighbor that you help takes you know to go to the store it really hits home and we believe that we need to start as a community to have more empathy and 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 trust and when things like this happen it's going to enable that and that was our next question it went into that how are you going to plan on implementing these long-standing culture changes within the state's attorney's office well and so there's going to be certain things that are just bright line we're not prosecuting simple possession of marijuana. I'm going to review all juvenile, any juvenile case for potential direct file. And again, I said there are certain cases that are, it's, it's legally required and I don't want to run afoul of anything. I'm going to review every case on a case by case basis, but large, larger than that. I want to have um, something similar to DA Williams in New Orleans called a civil rights unit where the, the conviction integrity unit is part of that. Um, we have a lot of failures in prosecution and it's you know people are fallible and so to expect infallible results from the criminal justice system is you know it's it's naive it's yeah. it's stupid it's i don't know I think of another word it's for. just it's just not realistic right and so and now, as somebody who's done capital defense for as long as i have you know Death Row is a great example of that. I mean, it's a great bad example of that in Florida. So Florida leads the country in wrongful convictions and exonerations from death row. So it's one in three. For every three people sentenced to die in Florida, one is exonerated. And that means factually innocent. And so even if you're a proponent of the death penalty, you want the person to be guilty of the crime that's getting executed. The national average is one in nine. And so Florida, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, it takes too long to execute people. And we have all these appeal processes and, you know, that should be done more quickly. But the reason we have those things is because we get it wrong so much in Florida. Mm. And we're talking about the ultimate punishment. And so I want to have a conviction integrity unit as part of a larger civil rights unit. And the civil rights unit, I want to investigate anywhere there's prosecutorial discretion allowed so, to make sure we have racial parity in all of our in all of our decision making so in charging decisions right so somebody gets arrested by a law enforcement officer who that law enforcement officer believes that person ha, or the officer has probable cause or believes that person has committed a crime but then it is still within the prosecutor's discretion to charge or not charge and so we need to be doing that equitably. And so I want there to be a civil rights unit. There will be a civil rights unit that investigates racial parity and charging decisions. Then what we're recommending as far as sentence, right? So that if you're a white defendant or a black defendant or a brown defendant, LGBTQ, whatever, whatever population you come from, these sentences should be equitable for the crime and the prior record. And then 
juvie direct file, death penalty. We've talked about those kind of things. And so mm-hmm. anywhere there is discretion afforded the prosecutor's office, the law contemplates that. I want us to be constantly self-investigating. And I believe in transparency and accountability. And so we'll have an equitability, or excuse me, um, an equity in sentencing software that we use to investigate all of those decisions. And then all of that will be publicly available on a dashboard on my website. That is mind blowing. That alone. Um, <laughs> we're data people too. We love, um, we no, love to- we're going to self investigate. There's been right. you know, very little investigation into implicit bias. I think we all work with our own biases. And so it's, it's our duty to self investigate both ourselves and what we're doing, our actions. And that's where I talk about the civil rights unit and making that publicly available. Okay, perfect. And now, can you correlate how being a public defender and a state attorney can run on the same core belief system for a better criminal justice system? Now, I know that you spoke of it's justice, and, and I just want my the public to hear your stance on this because it's, in, it's incredible. It's- right. And that's what I don't think they run afoul of each other. I see myself as an advocate for justice. And I can be that advocate no matter what side of the system that I'm on. I have a client actually who's on death row who I have discussed my decision to run for state attorney with. And he said to me, Allison, you can do more good in one year as the state attorney than 10 as an assisted public defender. And that's the truth. But I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. I have every intention of advocating for victims and next of kin of victims. It is also who I have been. And so I want to mention that briefly in that, you know, most people know me professionally as a career public defender, which I very much am. However, I also do work, I'm Catholic. I do work for the local diocese in St. Petersburg, as well as the Florida Conference of Catholic Bishops. I wrote a bill this past year to expand ineligibility for the death penalty to include the seriously mentally ill, which was filed in the Senate by Senator Jeff Brandis. Um, So we have a great relationship. And then I've also also been a victim of violent crime, which is part of why I, I knew I wanted to work in crime or in the criminal justice system as a lawyer. I was held at gunpoint when I was 15. I walked into a robbery in progress in Walgreens in Orlando, and the cashier could not overcome the fail-safe mechanisms to get the cash register open. And so the gentleman robbing the store walked over, put a gun to my head, and and took everybody's money who was in the store. And then I was raped in college. Um, And so being a victim of violent crime, and I'm also a mom, and I'm also a wife and a daughter. My parents live in the community as well. I think that I have insight both as a career defender, but as somebody who's been a victim and worked with victims. That's my work with the Catholic Church has largely been with um, ministering either to or with victims of violent crime or next of kin of homicide. That's beautiful. I saw reading your perspectives, um, the human side of you. And it, it touched me. Um, and like you said, there's so many things. And and that and the ability to do so many things, mom, member of the community, public defender, you know, you work in the church, you were a victim, a victim's advocate, all of these things allowed you to open your mind and see the brokenness. And it's it's touching to me. And that's one of the main reasons that I personally I'm supporting you. I just, I love it. Um, it's amazing. Onward. So <laughs> onward. onward, I digress. Um, I need to put up your name. I'm trying to run your name on the banner on the bottom. As much as I, I see, I'm like talking. I see myself. I see my name. Oh yeah, I got it all. Okay. So we did have uh, another question for you and it says much of the problems within the criminal justice system are well known. And we've talked about them and We all know what they are, but the solutions can be a bit tougher to identify. Now, have you had a chance to read the ready or not proposal at all? I did. Okay. Um, Under the solutions. And um, what's your take on implementing a parole system that guarantees release to those who are proven product of change after a certain amount of time is served? I'm unequivocally in favor of parole or returning parole. I want to make sure, though, to be clear in that. It's hard to 
sometimes it's, I should say the other way, sometimes it's easy to get in this space and want to fix all of the problems. Um, I think you and I both know how people are incarcerated in the Department of Corrections needs to be talked about, um, parole. And so as state attorney, I don't want to mislead. I have no control over parole or parole eligibility. Um, as your website states, the state of Florida eliminated parole almost 40 years ago. And so it comes back up every so often. There's a legislative push to bring back parole. Um, certainly any influence that I had or have, I would agree that the legislature, so I mean, the legislature, our lawmakers in Tallahassee decided to eliminate parole. I think there's some talk occasionally about bringing it back. I'm in favor of bringing it back. Um, I have seen those people that are serving life sentences or 50, 60 year sentences that at the time you would have never thought it possible and they have truly been rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have parole or conditional release for people who were sentenced pre the elimination of parole. It's called F4, the Florida Commission on Offender Re Reviewer Release. I'm not sure what the R is. Um, I would be frank in saying not many people um, and so that is only for folks who are sentenced predating the elimination of parole. And so that is a very small minority of folks and most people are not paroled. But so, yes, I would be in favor of the return of meaningful parole and a meaningful parole board. But that's not something that's within my discretion as the state attorney. And so I just wanted to be clear on that. All right. Now, for a very long time. Um, in our society and the tough on crime policies that cultivated the very unforgiving um, nature into the fabric of society. Um, and, and it just, it seems like whenever it started and it pushed so hard and then it was, you know, tough on crime and, and the drugs came, we became so numb and so callous. Now, do you believe this affected the intrinsic, excuse me, character of our society as a whole? And if so, how? Well, sure. Um, and so all of those things, I mean, I think that well, people are always well-intentioned at the time, or I like, I like to think that they are, right? So the war on drugs, the crime bill. I mean, we've heard President Biden say that he was in favor of the crime bill when it was passed in the early 90s. And since then, he's really spent his career trying to undo the effects of it. There were leaders in the Black community that were in favor of the crime bill and have now seen the dramatic effects that it, it has had in a negative way on the Black community. And so, I mean, it's interesting to me, you know, even studying capital punishment in that most people in America are still in favor of capital punishment, whereas most other industrialized first world countries don't have the death penalty. And so what is it about us as Americans that are in favor of the death penalty, where if you went to like England, they're not, right? And so right. it's, right, like why is one culture in favor of something when a similarly situated culture is not? And so a lot of our idea of punishment comes from this idea that there, and I, you know, I grew up with really conservative parents. I am a believer in punishment but I think that we have to be more thoughtful and it can't be, we have to move away from the carceral system. Not all punishment is putting somebody in jail or prison. And so I think that it has affected our idea of punishment over time is, is there's been a crime and now there must be a punishment and that has to be a, a, a carceral aspect. Exactly. And so we have to start somewhere and, and re-examining that to say, has that helped? Has that made us safer? And the answer is no, right? So we have the data to say, okay, over the last 40 years, we've been doing things this way and has it worked? Has it made us safer? And in fact, the opposite is true. We continue to see trends in rise of violent crime, gun violence are at an all time high right now. I think most people know that. Um, and I really don't think it's partisan or it shouldn't be partisan having conversations about common sense criminal justice reform. But we are in Florida with a Republican governor and a Republican legislature, Republican attorney general, and most of our sheriffs identify as Republican. And I would say that the more conservative approach has been this lock everybody up mentality. And it's gotten us where we are. And so I, I'm proposing that we try something else always with the eye of public safety 
but we haven't actually made anybody safer. We have not been good stewards of the taxpayer's dollar and we have victimized entire minority communities. Wow. I mean, it has been a chock full, informative, lovely <laughs> 30 minutes. I really appreciate being here. Um, as Shai has kindly put up all my information, <laughs> all of my website, Miller for State Attorney, has all of my contact information, email, um, cell phone number. I welcome anybody to reach out to me. I think that, you know, I'm not a politician. I've, I've recently entered the race to become an elected official. And I think there is an aversion to saying we don't have all the answers, but the truth is I don't have all the answers. I've been doing this a long time and I have some ideas. I think we have a broken system and I have some ideas how to fix it. But a friend of mine with the Southern Poverty Law Center said to me the other day that the communities that are most impacted by policies are rarely involved in the enactment of the policy. So I'm in the process of putting together a group of stakeholders from different communities um, hope, I think representation, um, diversity and representation is important. And so I'm putting together this group of stakeholders that we can hopefully come up with tangible plans and ideas for when I take office as elected state attorney. And so if there are folks that are interested in helping out either with the campaign or getting involved long term, I'd encourage you to reach out. Incredible. Well, it, um, we definitely let me put this back up. This is Allison right here. Um, check her out on her Facebook. She has that. What is it? Instagram. Um, Instagram. We're on Facebook. And the best one, yeah, and the best one is just go to the Allison Miller for State Attorney. It has everything there. Yep. Um, it's been our pleasure. Like we said, um, we can't wait to go on this journey with you. Um, it's going to be beautiful, and we're rooting for you. We we're ready for the change. And we're so happy that somebody's there to implement it. Thank you, Allison. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. It has been my pleasure today uh, to come into the studio with Allison and to be here with you. Um, thank you so much. Again, on the bottom right here, Allison Miller for State Attorney. We're going to put this guy right here. It's www millerforstateattorney.com. You guys check out Society First. Uh, we're ready for changes. Tune in next time. Can't wait to see you.